you will see a mosaic of impressions of our experience this year as the IWC Advocacy Committee at um, the Commission on the Status of Women in March. Um, our chalice is lighted. I hope you can see the, yes, our chalice is lighted. We are doing spiritual work when we do advocacy and international advocacy. And so uh, the chalice is with us to guide us in knowledge and in hope. I'm Reverend Carol Houston. I live in New York City. I am chair of the advocacy committee. Um, I've been active with uh, IWC since the beginning. I'm one of the past presidents. And I live in New York City, which put me close to the United Nations and to our wonderful uh, United Nations office when it was in existence and to the workings of the UN. And so I was always somewhat interested in it, um, but got more and more interested in it as I became more and more active around IWC and our international relationships with other countries. Um, women arrive in, for the Commission on the Status of Women in March. Um, thousands of women flood the streets of New York, uh, going to workshops, going to panels, going to presentations. I was aware of that before I started going to some of those meetings, but um, I seriously started attending CMS with uh, four other people uh, from, the, um, from IWC in 2018. And we attended uh, workshop sessions and webinar in 2018 and 2019. And then the three years of the COVID pandemic came in, uh, 2020, 2021, 2022, when uh, the Commission on the Status of Women was all virtual. This year, it was back to real life, um, hybrid with some virtual and some in person. But we had 11 delegates this year in town to uh, experience in person CMS, in person, the work of advocacy at the UN. And we will give you uh, a, a mosaic of their impressions today. Um, brief reports from almost all of the people who came to New York to be part of CMS IWC this, this year. Um, the first two speakers will be talking with you about the United Nations, about why is the United Nations important? Why have this, this group of women at IWC taken such an interest in, in the United Nations? And the first speaker on that topic will be Genya Peters. Genya. Good morning. Uh, my, uh, obviously, my name is Genya Peterson, and like Carol, I live fairly close to the UN right outside of New York City. Uh, I am often asked, does advocacy work at the UN make a difference? My response is yes, it certainly made a difference in my life. I was born in 1945 in a displaced persons camp in a tiny hamlet in southern Germany. My mother and I shared a room with 14 other women. When the, dis when the camps were first set up after World War II, it was assumed that they would be temporary, that there was a belief that the displaced people in the camps would return to the areas they came from, and many did. But there were many people like my mother whose areas were totally destroyed because of the war and had no place to return to. There was little ability to immigrate to another country because of the very restrictive immigration policies that were in place at the time. In 1948, the, uh, the UN Committee on Immigration was established. The committee was given the responsibility of running the displaced persons camps. Women's groups in North America 
quickly started lobbying the UN committee to pressure countries to change their immigration policies so that thousands of women and children could leave the camps. The newly formed UN Committee on Immigration, along with the numerous women's advocacy organizations, managed to get the US to change their immigration laws. In the fall of 1949, my mother was permitted to fill out an application to immigrate to the US. In September of 1950, my mother and I arrived in New York City. The, the UN Committee on Immigration and all the women's organizations who cared about women and children and the camps in the camps who had no place to go, not only changed my life, but improved lives of countless women and children. So yes, advocacy work with, at the UN makes a big difference. Thank you, Genya. Bruce Knotts lives in New York City. He um, is, was a wonderful uh, member of our delegation this year. He is active around IWC a lot these days. So Bruce, would you talk with us more about advocacy at the UN? Yes, very happy to do so. Uh, the International Convocation of Unitarian Universalist Women is the only UU organization with sustained and consistent engagement with the United Nations. For over 60 years, the UU UNO played this role. However, since I was retired from the UUA, nobody from the UUA has set even a foot at the United Nations nor engaged with the UN in any meaningful way. The UUSC provides UN access for their partners, but they don't engage the UN on policy issues. We usually see uh, colleagues from UUSC at the UN once or twice a year. Continuous advocacy at the UN is what the IWC is doing with all its members, especially Carmen, Carol, and I, and Genya, and a few others that are uh, constantly at the UN on a sustained basis. This level of engagement is necessary to build relationships and construct networks. The IWC is also engaged internationally with indigenous Unitarian Universalist women who work for women's empowerment and justice for indigenous peoples. There is no UU organization that even comes close to the deep engagement of IWC with the United Nations and with indigenous activist women working for justice and freedom around the world. I encourage all of those who supported the UUUNO to shift that support to the IWC as the IWC is the UU organization that is taking the mantle of the UUUNO and expanded the engagement with focus on freedom and justice for all with particular focus on the rights of women. When women enjoy equal rights and have power and authority equal to men, everyone benefits, even somebody like me. Our advocacy at the United Nations has resulted in mainstreaming LGBTIQ human rights, confronting systemic racism, founding UN Women, which is an office of the United Nations dedicated to women's empowerment, and founding the International Criminal Court, where most of the cases the ICC has taken up involve cases against uh, violence, to put down violence against women and much more. The data is clear and the historic evidence is conclusive that when women enjoy power and authority in equal measure to men, all outcomes for everyone dramatically improve. This is what the IWC is working to achieve. And this is why the IWC deserves your support. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. Um, yeah, we're working on it. We're, we're, we're staying in there. Um, Karen Korsh lives in Illinois, and she is going to bring you some uh, of the actual experience of being in person at uh, the uh, Commission on the Status of Women. She even has pictures. So Karen, please talk with us. All right. Um, I will be sharing some photos here for those of you who... Um, Um, all right. Um, 
slideshow here. Okay, go back to the beginning here. Uh, so um, this slide um, is the poster um, for the CSW 67 and it tells you about the theme. There's also a review theme. One of the things that happens at CSW is they review a theme from past years to see um, if the conclusions have been, you know, how, what the results are as far as a few years out. So there's the, the primary theme and the um, review theme. This is um, a picture of UN Women. UN Women is one of the organizations um, at the UN that um, was formed in recent history to, to help deal with women's issues because um, there was not enough structure at the UN to, um, to deal with gender equality and the issues that are unique to women. And then NGS, NGO CSW is an, is an organization that has been very helpful to us. Um, it, is, um, it works with the NGOs and it helps us to prepare for CSW and, and gives people in NGOs like ours a chance to, um, to interact and um, plan and learn how the UN works. And, and so it's a great networking opportunity for us as an NGO. Um, here I have a picture of waiting in line for badges at the UN. Um, I stood in line for three hours to get my badge. So I think it was a matter of, um, <laughs> of poor timing. If I would have been able to arrive in, in New York, um, early before CSW started, I maybe could have avoided that. So I learned an important lesson. Um, here's a picture of our delegation meeting at a cafe on the UN, in the UN complex. And here is another picture of us meeting for lunch. This is a picture of Antonio Gutierrez, the general secretary of the um, UN. This is Seema Bahus, um, UN Undersecretary General and Director of UN Women. Here I have a, a picture of a side event. Side events are usually run by, um, by various states. So they're higher level than, the, um, than the, the events that the NGOs put on. So there's all different levels of presentations at CSW. This is a picture at a parallel event I went to. The parallel events are put on by NGOs and are usually held off of the UN campus. So they're um, in various buildings outside the UN campus, but in the neighborhood. This is the church center, and this is where the UUA had their UN office prior to it being shut down during the pandemic and never reopening. And this is where a lot of the parallel events are held. The beautiful, the chapel on the first floor is a beautiful installation. It's a nice place to visit. Here I have a snapshot of the Whova app, which is for um, people that attended virtually use this Whova app. And we also who were in person used it to keep track of our schedules and things. Um, those of you who have been to the UUA's General Assembly may have used this app. And this is um, a, an example of how the um, parallel event showed up in the Whova app. This is a, um, our poster for our um, one of the events that IWC put on and our events were virtual. We, were, we did not have in-person events at CSW, they were virtual. And here's our second event for the, those of you, you were probably familiar. I know many of you attended. Um, there's some beautiful artwork at the UN. This is the most photographed and popular piece of art called Nonviolence. This is the Ark of the Return. Um, this is also beautiful piece of art. It's relatively new. I think it was unveiled in 2015. 
and it's a must see if you're able to visit the UN relating to slavery. And here, um, this was International Women's Day. One of the things that, um, one of the events was that people, that there was chalk available. And um, so people were free to write messages on the sidewalk. And a lot of the messages were very inspirational. So that was, that was a very bright spot in the day. And here um, are the sustainable development goals. This is something important at the UN and something for you to learn about. So um, for those of you not familiar with the sustainable development goals, please Google it and uh, read about it because um, it's an important part of the work that the UN does. And this is L Linda Thomas Greenfield. She's our US ambassador to the UN. And then finally, I have a slide about the agreed conclusions. Um, every year, the the UN, the CSW publishes agreed conclusions, and it's a long, complex doc document, but it's something worth taking a look at. So again, that's something that you can look up um, and read. And I suggest that to become more familiar with how CSW operates and what what is accomplished while we're there. And um, yeah, that's the, that's the gist of my presentation. Thank you, Karen. An overview of what it was like to be there, to be there together and in person. Um, Beth O'Connell is uh, Zooming in today from Paris where she lives. And she did not uh, come to New York, uh, she was attending virtually. As I said, this was hybrid this year, both the virtual component and the, um, and, and, and the online and, and the in-person component. So Beth, would you please talk to us about being there virtually this year? Okay, thanks, Carol. Um, it was quite easy to, uh, to attend. Uh, it's quite easy to attend CSW uh, virtually and the events held at UN headquarters, most of them were broadcast on um, UN web TV. And so the production was great. You could see, you could hear everything that was being said. You could hear the questions from the audience. Um, they, were real, it, they were really great uh, to attend. And then you had what, uh, what, uh, what Karen was just explaining, the parallel events. Now the parallel events are held by uh, are, are held by the NGOs, and some of them were in person in in New York, and a lot of them were virtual, um, like ours. We IWC we did two events, two parallel events at CSW this year, and they were virtual, so you didn't have to be in New York um, uh, to attend, and. Um, uh, we did one that was that was uh, presented by uh, the members of our young adult network, and that was called "Learning and Mobilizing in the Digital Space: Experiences of Global Young Women," and it was excellent. They it was presented by the young women. Uh, one of the uh, uh, they were the moderators. That one of the presenters at the at the discussion was a young woman who had participated in the program from the UK. And then they also had an expert, um, someone who is um, studying the impact of, uh, of social media mobilization. Uh, and the case study that she, was, that she gave was, was the use of mobile, um, uh, of social media uh, by uh, the women in Iran. For that whole that whole move that whole movement that that women have um, have started in in Iran, um, and what was interesting about that was uh, about our, about IWC's parallel events is that we had excellent engagement with the audience. We had excellent questions from the audience. We uh, also highlighted people in the audience so they could share their own experiences and also ask, ask questions. So there was really great interaction. And I'll be honest, other parallel events that I attended, I did not see 
that kind of engagement with the audience. Um, I th what we've learned over the years at IWC is that we don't overload our, our panel discussions. We make sure that we leave time for Q&A, for interaction uh, with the audience. Um, and our, our second uh, uh, event was Women with Disabilities Crossing the Digital Divide. We had a young woman from Romania who was one of the recipients of a small IWC project that we did during the pandemic where we gave laptops to disadvantaged girls in, um, in Transylvania and um, she's a young woman with a motor uh, disability. So she, she shared um, what the laptop meant to her kind of, um, and she had a, a Unitarian minister with her who translated from her Hungarian uh, into English. And then we had two experts, one from the Women's Enabled International and another a woman, and she was in the UK and the other woman from the Philippines who started an association for the visually impaired. And she's also very involved in the UN's um, Generation Equality Collective. So these are, these are people that are really uh, well, well informed about the rights of the disabled. They're very involved. Um, internationally uh, in advocating for the rights of the disabled. And as we pointed out, any one of us could become physically disabled at any, any point in life, and especially as we get older. So there was great sharing when we opened up to questions, you know, people, people talking about their, exper their experiences with um, physical uh, disabilities. And um, so again, um, I think that was a, a really, I was it was that was a really a powerful and really great thing about the parallel events um, and the, the events that IWC held that we had this great interaction with the audiences. Thank you, Beth. And it's wonderful you you did a good job of putting the disability event together and getting us working with other organizations. That kind of um, collaboration through these, these meetings, uh, it's important. Um, at least one person that was uh, active on the uh, young adult uh, workshop is with us, Alicia Rani from India. I believe she's here and uh, perhaps we can talk with her a bit during the question session. Carmen Caprillas has been attending um, Un the United Nations for events for for a long time and has become very active. And we are really blessed to have her working with us. She is calling in from La Paz, Bolivia, and she will talk about what goes on at, at uh, the Commission on the Status of Women uh, as the official work that they're doing. The member states working together to put together statements and outcome documents. Carmen, talk to us about the UN, please. Uh, good morning, Carol. He hello, everybody. It's nice to see you all. Uh, yes. Uh, well, the CSW, like many other meetings of UN, is really big. I think the biggest one that takes place in New York is CSW. I believe there were around 5,000 uh, women that went to participate in everything that was going on. And I think it was like 8,000 that were like online on the on the platform that the, uh, that was just mentioned, where we could access side events online. And there were a number of other dynamics that were going on. But out of all this, almost 10,000 people that are following and around CSW, uh, the ones that are negotiating actually, uh, there's a, uh, the negotiators are around between 200 and 300, and the advocates are like another 300. So only around 600 do the advocacy work, the, the drafting and the inputs for the, uh, the document. The document outcome I already posted on the chat, you can all download it, it's in PDF. And those are the, agree, the agreed uh, uh, conclusions. And what is special about this is that, well, the 
the issue of this year was innovation and technology change and education in the digital age for achieving gender equality and empower of all women and girls. What does that mean? Uh, why is it important to touch uh, this issue on uh, United Nations? It's because as many of you have noticed, we are in the AI, uh, in the AI era already. And talking with my, 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 my colleagues, we were thinking that we were not going to see the implementation of AI. Nevertheless, now we're using AI, interacting with AI almost on a daily basis. And this is another industrial revolution, another phase like the, the fifth industrial, industrial revolution. And it's important to address that because it's creating again, another gap. We were already, especially in the divide between North and South or developing and developed countries, we were already like closing a little bit the gap. And again, AI is opening the, the gap uh, again, because it's another kind of technology that we need to kind of like focus on. But it, this was not meant for AI. This was meant for technologies that were before like uh, internet and so but because when we when we talk about technology we have to understand that even a toilet is technology and that still we have uh, places in the world where uh, you cannot access what we consider basic for us i don't know cell phones or uh, internet but the data that was given uh, in the in the csw for example for latin america only four women of every 10 women in Latin America can access Wi-Fi. So that means that internet is not accessible to every uh, uh, to everyone, especially women. And then it's a whole lot of knowledge that we have to uh, to uh, to uh, push. And that's why in the agreed conclusions, there's uh, a, a part that talks about promotion, uh, how uh, how women can engage to technology use, then there is a, how to adopt gender responsive technology design, because most of the technology is always like designed for men and not for women. Then there is a part of strengthening fairness and transparency and accountability, because uh, it's important that we know who's accessing and, and try to make it accessible for like everybody. Uh, there's a part about enhancing data and science to achieve gender equality. Uh, science still a big issue for Global South. Science is done in US, in Europe, and very few other countries, but it's not something that it's going on uh, on full scale in the, whole, uh, in the whole planet. And there's a whole discussion around that. But then we, the other thing that uh, technology can bring is violence. So we need to also focus on uh, preventing the elimination of all forms of violence, including uh, gender-based violence that we have seen a number of cases in side events and so on about uh, how violence is manifesting in social media and in other, in other spaces, digital spaces. Uh, and then there is a part that talks about finance. It is important to lever finance for inclusive digital transformation, because if we don't focus putting finance on achieving, uh, on, on, on uh, making more accessible uh, the, the technology to different kinds of women and different technology, then uh, we still were that this gap is going to grow. So we are at stage where it's very important to put a lot of emphasis on this on this issue. So, uh, mm, but in the, 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 the important part about us as civil society, as NGO, is how we can um, we can advocate and we uh, uh, around policies toward this uh, these issues because uh, there's. This is all linked to a number of issues that we need to address and that we need to push within CSW. So the uh, conclusions include those voices that don't usually get to participate in these spaces. And one of the 
uh, last things, and with this I want to conclude, is that we need to uh, create the capacities to start making a podcast, to start influencing decision makers, because all this, this document, it has to be translated into policies at national level. So that's the most important part around CSW and around the outcome document. And there is issues that are very, uh, uh, that has a lot of technicality, technicalities. And I want to give just one example in CSW, which is the use of family or families. And for us, we could say like normal people, it's the same thing. But actually, every word has its context. When we when you see family in one of these texts, it means like the normal family, women, men, and kids. And when we see when we talk about families, then we're acknowledging the whole the the widespread uh, the wide range of families that there are. That's not only uh, the mother and the father and the son, but also the other kinds of families that are uh, going around the, the the world. And there's a dis discussions of that kind of like uh, words, which word should be like the most politically correct. So the, the negotiations go around this particular words. So it's very important to have that technical knowledge in order to push for issues, because if we're not aware of those, then the policies are going to have uh, mm, flaws in that, in, in that regard. So, uh, that is important to take into account. Uh, thank you, and I'm open later for any questions. Thank you, Carmen. Um, yes, moving toward advocacy is our goal at, at IWC, finding, finding ways to, to bring ourselves to be in those conversations, which actually do go forward through the member states. Um, the other three speakers are going to talk with us about um, their takeaways about things that they have uh, done and learned and been around at uh, at the United Nations and uh, and and what 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 it is that they use in their lives that come from that. First is Ellen Barfield. Um, she has longer experience at the UN than most of us do with other organizations, and she'll talk about that. She, like me, is in Lenape territory. Um, she's in the Maryland part of Lenape territory. Ellen? Ashley Carroll, today I'm calling in from New York City. I'm up oh. here for the, the visit of the Golden Rule Peace Sailboat, which is another topic okay. entirely. But yes, I live in Baltimore, which is um, many tribes have been there. It's kind of a passageway up and down the East Coast. So, and I think it's wonderful that we do acknowledge the tribal lands on whom we we all reside these days. Um, I have formally represented an organization called Veterans for Peace to the United Nations for quite a while through a lower tier of qualification called the... the um, Global Communications Office. ECOSOC is the higher status and that's what the IWC has. And getting into these high level summits like the Commission on the Status of Women entails having that higher status which Veterans for Peace does not have. So I have written on the coattails of the IWC to be able to attend the Commission on the Status of Women. And last year, Veterans for Peace did present a side event that IWC helped sponsor and and insert in the program, uh, a session about violence toward women serving in the military, which was very powerful and it was a great opportunity. It happens that Carol and I met each other at a side event uh, probably in 2018. I don't remember exactly, but that's how the connection got made, although I have been a UU but I didn't know about the IWC until I met Carol. But my just physical geographical knowledge has been a big help to the group and I've been delighted to be able to do that. And to talk about advocacy at the United Nations and does it work, you bet it does. You may have been able to look at the outcome document. It's 26 pages, 89 items. It's a lot of stuff. And as Carmen was just mentioning, it gets into the nitty gritty, it gets into the details, it gets into how women are disadvantaged 
because of lack of funding, lack of government services, lack of internet access in this case, and the training and the concern for safety, absolutely. Stalking and outing and all kinds of terrible things happen to women online from grouchy people who want to attack somebody and know that's a, a, a soft target sometimes. So that's very important and it's great that those things get discussed in UN circles and can be advocated against and programs can be advocated and supported to help provide better access, better training, better safety. So advocacy is incredibly important. And as Carmen said, a, a total of about 10,000 women participated in the CSW this year. And it was delightful to be back in person, face to face for those of us who could do that. But the online access is totally critical too. And having long access to the United Nations, I've watched it grow up electronically. When I first got involved, it was still foreign territory for the most part to the United Nations. But they figured out they better get there and they did. And as, as Genya, I believe, mentioned, the, um, the UN Web TV is very valuable. They, they film and show most official meetings of the United Nations. You can get a feel for it that way. The UN is about the other way for nations to interact. There's war, and that's what my organization, Veterans for Peace, challenges every way we can. And they're sitting down and talking about it. And unfortunately, because of the way the UN is structured and the way it was put together, there are some that are more equal than others among the nations at the UN. But the big conferences like the CSW can challenge that and can bring the daily experience of thousands of people to the UN with their personal stories and their personal concerns. It's deeply important, and I strongly urge you to get involved as much as you can. As I said, you can do all of this online if you need to, but physically it's great if you can do that too. And I'm happy to help people just navigate the confusing physical space of the UN. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Ellen. Julie Steinbach is uh, zooming in from California, and she will talk about her um, her experiences in in uh, in a, a couple of CSW meetings. Good morning. Uh, Karen showed a, a a picture of standing in line for the passes. I I grabbed my pass to be able to show you what she's talking about. The um, Phyllis and I arrived on the weekend, so we were actually able to walk right in and get our pass without the three hour wait. Anyway, what I want to talk about is what CSW means to me. For me, it's all about the connections that I'm, I um, experience and make there. And here are three examples I want to share. At my um, And Karen has the, the pictures that go with it. At my first CSW in 2019, in person, the last one in person before COVID, um, not the conclusion, Karen will find it, I met Mabuba Siraj, the Afghan women's rights activist, um, after a, a filming about women's peacemakers in Northern Ireland, Liberia, and Afghanistan, in which she was featured, saying this line, we don't need to educate ourselves, we need to educate others. And in the conversation afterwards, um, I discovered that she had a Southern California connection, which led to her coming and speaking at our United Nations uh, local chapter, uh, UNA, United Nations Association um, local chapter later that year in December. She was subsequently, the few months later, named one of Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People. We've kept in touch. And when the US pulled out of Afghanistan in August, 2021, the humanitarian devastation there inspired my creating an online fundraiser for UNICEF using Mabuba's work as the hook. The fundraiser to, was I set up to mark my 75th birthday, so I set a goal of $7,500. I raised $8,864. Some of you contributed. Thank you. At this CSW, I attended a parallel event featuring another Afghan leader from Kabul 
who told me that Mabuba is continuing to run her women's program support and protection program there in Kabul as much as she can. It's a challenge. This year, my favorite new connection was with Patty Torsney, a former member of the Canadian House of Commons, representing the riding of Burlington. Riding, this is a new, this is Canada speak for um, district, a new word to me, in Burlington in Ontario. We met when I was looking for an event at the Uganda House on 45th Street across from the UN where her office is as UN Observer in New York for the Interparliamentary Union, IPU. We connected again at a side event the next day about digital harassment of women politicians, which is what Carmen was just referring to as well, which made me think of the unexpectedly early retirements of Jacinda Ahern in New Zealand and Nicola Sturgeon in Scotland. My suspicion was confirmed by one speaker. My last example of the connections made at CSW was my reunion this year with the Grail women met in 2019. The first CSW delegates I ever met over a decade ago were here in Claremont at Pilgrim Place where 15 some women retired uh, who are longtime members of the Grail the century-old interfaith international women's organ, uh, movement, currently active in 22 countries. I've attended its parallel events, both in person in 2019 and virtually the last two years, being particularly inspired by the engagement of young men, women, as young as in their teens and 20s. This year, I met again the elder leaders, and besides attending the Young Women's Parallel event on the spirituality of activism, I went out to the Grail Center in the Bronx, this, these two pictures are from that, on Saturday, where its open house featured cultural sharings by the young women from Mexico, Mozambique, Papua New Guinea, Portugal, Tanzania, and the US. And I wanna add that it was one of the first women that I met who um, uh, had attended CSW a long time ago, Mary Gindhart here at Pilgrim Place, um, died last year, and at her memorial service, uh, her niece from um, from Boston, Barbara Ginhart, was there, and we met. I was happy to see Barbara on our call this morning, discovering that she's a Unitarian in Boston, and she's become involved with us as well. So this is an example of the kind of uh, networking and connection that CSW affords. And for me, the Grail is a model of a multi-generational international women's service and activism movement. And I believe IWC can learn much from the Grail as from all the other contacts that we make at, at CSW. So uh, I love sharing, I love going, and I love being there again next year. Angeli, we can learn so much from you. You are such a master at making connections and keeping connections. Thank you. And uh, the UN is a beautiful place to do that. Um, our last speaker is Phyllis, Phyllis Marsh from, uh, from Maryland. Uh, she was uh, one of the first people I was with in CSW in 2018, where uh, we also met Ellen. Um, Phyllis, talk to us about uh, your takeaway from this year's um, CSW. So thank you, um, Carol. <clears throat> um, uh, Karen is going to share her screen and bring up some uh, some slides uh, for us that I prepared, just a few of them, because I think it will help me explain more about what I what I did and what I, what I saw. Um, so, Karen? <laughs> so this, this is a slide that I prepared for a different presentation, but I brought it back up because when I first started talking about going to the United Nations, it was the first time I had really considered that civil society 
has been recognized by the United Nations as a necessary part of the work that they do since the beginning. I always thought of nations joining together, but it's civil society that plays a really important part. And in researching it for today, I found on the UN website that currently there are 6,343 NGOs in consultative status um, with ECASOC. Most of them are in special consultative status, which is what we are. So go to the next slide, please, Karen. Um, this was my first, this was my third in-person attendance at CSW. Uh, when in 2018, 2019, got shut down for the next three years, and I went in person this year. And I bring this slide back up because you will notice that the topic of CSW was innovation and technological change, education in the digital age. These topics are chosen a couple years, uh, well ahead of time so that people and countries can plan. But in the meantime, things happen in the world that are important, that nations feel uh, important to raise at CSW. And the next three events that I went to are responding to what has happened in the world since this topic was adopted. And that is that there was a war in Ukraine. Russia invaded. It caused many women and children to flee to other countries surrounding it. And there has been a response to that from the other nations. So one of the events that Julie and I attended, and if you'll go to the next slide, I have copied for you the event that we, this is how the event was announced for us to choose, and you can choose, there are so many events to choose from, it, it is a choice. And this one was sponsored by Chikia, I think is how they pronounce it, or the Czech Republic and Ukraine. And as you can see, it is integrating women refugees, NGOs as key partners and a force for change. This is not about the digital age. This one happened to be held at the permanent mission of the Czech Republic to the UN. So, which was about a three block walk from UN headquarters. And uh, it was a pretty small room and they had lots of speakers, but it was a very interesting one. And if you'll go to the next slide, I highlighted another part of this, um, this announcement that was important. No, nope, go back up, go back up one more. Okay, female refugees and asylum seekers, particularly those arriving with children, face many obstacles in different areas. Housing, training, and language courses, labor market, child care, and health care. Governments cannot respond to all that. It takes NGOs like ours, like the women that we heard that day. And I want to say that IWC has also been a part of that response in running a Faithify uh, campaign to raise money to provide an educational course for Ukrainian children held in Hungary, the very, a very early education so that the children could learn their language and how to read and write their language among other things. So they could then go on to learning digitally. Go on to the next slide. Um, whoops. <laughs> uh, I put these up there because this is going to be shown. No, go up one more because I highlighted another part of what, what we do. One more. There. Here's where we do. This is what the NGOs do. What is so important for why, why we became involved. We, NGOs are responsible for distributing basic goods, water, food, shelter, legal counseling, a whole gamut of things that governments working to support the war effort are not able to do. That's important. That is 
one of the things that we can do to, to support those things. The next one that I went to is, and that's the one that has the blue in it, is a very special one that was held in the trusteeship council chambers, sponsored by many countries, not just Ukraine, not just the Czech Republic. And I want you to look at the very top line that I have there. It says, women as agents in conflict and reconstruction. And a good part of what I heard at this one was that, yes, women have been victims of sexual violence by the Russian army, and it has been horrendous. But we are now starting to talk about women as agents of change, not just as um, victims. And there was a very many top level women who came to speak about that. And the one who spoke for the, uh, the government commissioner for gender equality in Ukraine talked about how the sexual violence against women by the Russian soldiers, which has been horrendous. Ukraine government has responded by establishing centers in five different cities for the women to come in, to speak of their experiences, to receive counseling. We're not gonna hide it this time. They, 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 their attitude is, we're gonna speak up. We're going to cause, have a change. The next event Julie and I went to is the one, the next one. And it was that the evening after I heard that, speak, that speech, it was held at the Ukrainian Institute, which was a, a, a good taxi ride away from where the UN is held. Ukrainian Institute is usually a cultural center. And it was sexual crimes of the Russian armed forces in that uh, the typo was actually in what was in the program in Ukraine. And here is the picture of the sign that was, that was there when we showed up. The um, Ukrainian per, representative to the United Nations greeted us and he started with this, with saying sexual crime using sexual violence against women as an act of war has been around since the beginning of time and he reminded us that the Russian soldiers did this in Germany following World War II and the women in Germany didn't speak about it many of until they were in their late 80s 90s they kept quiet about it. And so it was a shock to us. I remember hearing that at the first time. Also speaking at this institute, at this program, was a woman who had been in Crimea when the Russians um, entered Crimea 10, 12 years ago. And she had been sexually violated by the Russian soldiers. And she had not been able to speak of it for several years. And finally, she went to one of the centers, uh, like what has been established now, and started speaking about it and how healing that was. We also saw a film about uh, where we heard another woman speak of her experiences. And the, the Ukrainian ambassador made the statement we need to speak out and we need to hold Russia responsible. It is a crime to use sexual violence against women as an instrument of war. And so after listening to that and being in those two special programs, I turned to Julie, I was very moved by it. And I said, Julie, I'm going to go home and I'm gonna write my senator and ask him to get involved in this, to find out what is going on, to speak up. My Senator is Senator Van Hollen, who serves on the Foreign Relations Committee. And I did go home and I did write a letter to him and, then, and explained who I'd heard, where I'd been, what I'd done. And the next slide will show my, what I asked him to do. So if you can, um, I asked him to learn more about it listen to the stories, speak up, and seek ways to hold Russia accountable for the crime. 
I have not heard back from him, but he lives, but his office is nearby. And so I'm thinking the next thing I will, I should do, could do, probably will do is to go make an appointment with one of his aides and go in and, and follow up on him. So I was very moved to action this year. Thank you, Phyllis. Bringing things full circle, bringing things back home and doing something about it. We have a few more minutes for questions. Um, please put any questions that you might have for anyone into the chat. And while you're doing that, I will express my gratitude on behalf of our committee for uh, those of you who took the time to be with us this morning to learn about um, more about the United Nations and uh, CSW. Um, there's more you can do in the future future. Uh, we have, we will send you other reports and other updates. Um, we have a monthly meeting on the first Friday of every month, and that is open. We have wonderful discussions. The learning curve is long on working with the United Nations. So when you start attending meetings, um, there'll be questions you need to ask, things you need to understand, but please feel free to come to those meetings and we will notify you of the next couple of meetings so that you can, you can do that. Also, in an effort to make our communication worldwide, we are going to, we have recorded this and we are going to show it again um, 35 hours from now, 10 o'clock Eastern Daylight Time which puts it into a better time frame for West Coast of Canada and US and also um, Australia, Japan, Philippines and, uh, and Eastern Asia. So tell your friends, if you have friends on the West Coast, if you have friends in, uh, in East Asia or Australia, tell them about this. It will be um, played again with the same link uh, 10 o'clock Eastern time, which puts it into Thursday morning um, in, in Asia. So, Jofi, do we have questions? Um, I've been following the chat. So by the way, hello everyone. Um, I'm uh, Jofi Asensky, Executive Director of the International Convocation of UU Women. And um, thank you all for your wonderful presentations. Um, I, we actually have a lot, some messages related to thanking you, all of you for your wonderful presentations. Like, thank you so much. It was amazing to hear from all the speakers. Uh, another person says, yes, it was very interesting. Thank you all. Thank you for sharing. Uh, this was very good. Many things. I do not see any particular questions. So what you can also, what, what, what folks can also do is just um, raise your hand or, um, and be in line to speak. You'll find that uh, under rea uh, uh, reactions, uh, raise your, any, and I'm just checking to see if anybody would like to speak up rather than put their questions in the chat. I do not, uh, I, we have one more in the chat, uh, another thank you note. Thank you for the diversified reports, very stimulating and motivating. Uh, one second, let me see, Audrey. Yes, there is a question from Audrey Brooks, and we do have uh, Peggy Canada uh, in line who has a question, but let me read the question from Audrey. How do we arrange to attend the United Nations as a member of IWC? Registration, accommodation, costs, etc. And I don't know right, who I'll, this I'll, question should I'll answer, go to. I, I can answer that and somebody else can come in if they mm -hmm. want. Um, we have uh, for CSW each year, we can have uh, 20 people attend in person and it is um, a red, there's a registration process and then a letter of approval and then, and then you come and sign in. Um, it's it's expensive. I mean, it, I, well, there's no cost to attending uh, CSW. The UN events are free, and the, all the 
parallel and side events are free. So, so what you're doing here is free, but of course, um, airplane fare to New York City and staying in a hotel is uh, has 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 expense to it, and and that's there is that to bear in mind. Um, we do have roommates, though people people room together to to save some money on that score. Um, the deadline for registration for CSW tends to be the end of January, so it is something you'd you'd need to be thinking about. Um, long before March. But um, no, there's room for everyone. Please come. Please think about coming. And coming to New York is always fun. Did I forget anything on that score? Actually, I'd like to add that if we have more than 20 for our delegation slot, the UUA is also in ECOSOC status with the, um, <clears throat> uh, is in consultative status with the UN. So, so there are 20 slots available there as well. So we could have almost 40 people, which would really be fun because it's it's really so much more fun and and um, and helpful when we, as you saw the pictures, we met regularly uh, as a delegation to share our experiences and ideas. Uh, so uh, yeah, come on. If you're close to New York at all, come on up. And there are other meetings at the UN. Um, in July, there's something called the High Level Political Forum, and some of us are going to attend that. And if you are interested, we can tell you more about that, about what what that entails. Um, there there are meetings um, next year that 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 will be very interesting. Uh, it's not just the Commission on the Status of Women, although that will always be a place where we have uh, have real engagement but there are other meetings to go to. And, and, and uh, later this month, Beth in Paris is going to go to a conference on um, plastics, on, on uh, environmental impact of plastic. And so there's, it's not just the Commission on Status of Women, there are other meetings as well, much to become engaged in. Yes, join us, please do. Let, let, let me chime in here a little bit you. if I can. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> okay, thanks, Bruce. Just, you've probably gleaned, if you didn't know already, that the UN is enormous and complicated, and one huge value of having a bunch of us there for whatever, and as Carol said, there's a lot more than just the CSW, you can understand why we focus on that, but if a bunch of us are there, we can compare notes about having gone to a broad spectrum of meetings. One of the wonderful things I always am able to connect with is a group called Muslims for Progressive Values, who hold great sessions with, at the CSW, women involved in Muslim countries in pushing women's rights and, and other concerns. I love connecting with them. A lot of us have those regular groups that we meet back up with, but it's huge and it's complicated. And the more of us who are there, the more we can compare notes. So come if you can. It's it's not cheap either. Yes, but it's so much so much value, and we do share rooms. And all of that. So come if you can. I strongly encourage it. Thanks. Yeah, let me chime in. Great. Okay, now you you mentioned Muslims for Progressive Values. I've got to talk about them. Uh, so Anis Unfeld, who is the founder and uh, uh, of Muslims for Progressive Values, came to my office some years ago, and she talked about the wonderful work that she's doing. One of the more controversial things that she was noted for is that she will lead prayers. She will be the imam and lead prayers of mixed congregations of men and women. And a lot of people found that controversial, but she will actually quote the Holy Quran and say, there's nothing in the Quran that says that I can't do this. And so she does. So uh, she talked to me and I said, you need to be at the UN. And she said, well, how do I go about doing that? I said, well, first of all, we need to talk to Peggy Carey. And Peggy Carey well, is the sister of Senator John Kerry, former Secretary of State. And I sent an email to Peggy, uh, who was working at the US mission at the time. And her she phoned me like right away. And she said, is she still in your office? Can I come meet her? And I said, yes, come on over. And so she met with uh, Anis Anfeld, and we both laid out a program 
to get her consultative status at the UN. And a lot of her work she has done in Geneva, and she didn't have uh, ECOSOC status at the time. She had DGC status to begin with. And so we actually used our status to get her appointment so she could uh, have uh, workshops in Geneva. So we love the work that she does. She's now on the United Nations Advisory Board of Religious Organizations. Um, and she's become a real powerhouse. And it's one of the things that we've been pretty uh, proud of doing is opening up doors for other organizations to come and work at the UN. And that's one of the things I wanted to mention. I mean, if you go into the UN website and you look at the daily events that are happening there, yes, often you need a, a UN pass and some of us have annual passes that, that we can use throughout the year. But there are such things as day passes, and you can register for a meeting, and you put in there that I don't have a pass, I need a day pass. And so you actually line up uh, at, the, at the front gate before you go through security. They will have day passes there if you're registered, and you can get a day pass and still go to the meetings. So um, there are many ways of doing it. And if you get in touch with those of us that are pretty uh, adept at this sort of thing, we'd be happy to guide you through the process. But um, the UN is open for all people. I consider it the people's house and they consider it the people's mm -hmm. house. And the more people of whatever stripe or standard, age, race, whatever, get in there and, and see what's going on and participate, the better it is for the United Nations and the better it is for all of us. So I really encourage people to get involved. Also, if, if you can't make it to New York, there's a lot of stuff online and you can attend a lot of meetings virtually. So uh, don't be a stranger, get involved with the UN. Thank you, Bruce. Anything else? All I right. Would, I would, um, um, Carol, uh, Carol yeah. uh, Peggy Canada from Japan raised her hand yeah. and not, not too long ago, uh, Peggy, uh, is your would you still like to ask a question? Please go ahead. Um, well, just having heard very briefly at this at this point about participating in meetings at the UN, um, there was a question from someone else, and I too am curious: Why does uh, why do you, the Unitarians or UUA, I guess, Unitarians in North America, no longer support an office at the UN? Uh, may I ask that question for whoever asked it? It's um, it's a long question that we have been discussing um, in IWC circles for for a while. Um, I, I and I don't I, I I don't I don't defend it. I'm sorry. I am I am sad that the UN office isn't isn't there. Um, it, it still exists in um, in name, but uh, but is not active. Uh, seems to me that there is a change of focus that the UUA is intent on being more of a domestic uh, faith group and not an international faith group, which troubles me because international is one of the places that I get my spirituality. But um, yes, changes are changes are happening. Um, th this conversation could go on forever, and, and I, I don't think we should go with it. But any other brief state comments from anyone else uh, would be welcome, uh, and then we'll close. Well, anyway, it is an issue. And, Actually, um, I, I would like to add that- It is yes. where the UUA is going. Yeah, Julie, go ahead. Yeah, I want to add that we, that we Sorry, did have more conversation about that very issue at one of the uh, monthly Friday meetings. So, uh, you know, those kinds of conversations can happen um, in a smaller group. So, uh, I invite you to participate or join us. Check us out the first Friday of the month. First Friday of the month. Yep. Yep. Come, come, come to our meetings. We have wonderful. We, we do a little bit of business of figuring things out, but then we, then we talk about things. So yeah. 
there could be a good conversation about that. Well, thank you. Thank you again, all of you, for being with us today. Um, please stay, stay tuned to additional reports. Uh, think about coming to New York. Think about checking out UN Web TV and finding meetings and events that way. And uh, know that um, our sixth principle still applies. We, uh, we, we look for international spirituality with liberty and justice for all. The goal of world community. That's what we're working on. So, so be it. Thank you all. And uh, we will talk another time, I'm sure. So take care. Bye-bye.